Look, here's the reality. Two kingdoms are being built right now. Mine and his. My job is to do the best I can to build the kingdom people want to be a part of. Sure. Do I lie a little bit to get there? But hey, at least in this life, you can enjoy your stuff. And I mean lots of stuff. Houses, cars, fancy vacations, jewelry, caviar, all of it. Do you know how this is all going to end? Sure. I read the book. I know the end game here. Look, I'm not concerned about the future. If I'm going down, I'm taking as many people with me as possible. I can tell you this much. In this life, I'm going to help people live for themselves and enjoy every minute of it. Who cares what tomorrow brings? Clapping for the devil. Boy, I never thought I'd... I never thought I'd see the day at HDC. It is great to uh, see you. Welcome here in Victorville over in Apple Valley. What a blessing to have you all here. If you did not receive a copy of the outline, raise your hand. That might be productive in uh, the long run as well as give you a chance to take down some notes from the incredible wisdom that will be shared today from this stage. No, but seriously, (laughs) it's always good to see you. Now, we are in the last part today of a series on money. If you are visiting with us today, uh, no, we don't always talk about money here. In fact, we talk about it about 5% of the time. Money becomes one of the themes for our presentations. Every 18 months or so, we will share a few weeks about the subject of finances or giving or generosity. And one of the reasons we do that is because we believe Jesus was right about everything. And Jesus talked about money or a related theme directly uh, related to money uh, over 50% of the time. So the people 2,000 years ago that he was teaching had a big problem with money and that continues to be a dominant theme in our culture as well. And so we really don't apologize for teaching you what the Bible says about money. Today, in fact, we will discover that the best way to gauge your heart for God is not to necessarily meet together at church or brave the elements on a cold, rainy weekend to attend a worship service. The best way to gauge your heart for God is to simply go home uh, later on today and look at your bank statement because that reflects your heart for the Lord. And you'll see that today because that's what Jesus, once again, is going to tell us. Now, keep in mind, we talk about heart disease. That's our theme today. But keep in mind, the question that we are not asking in this series is, do you believe in Jesus? Because I already know what you would say, so I wouldn't want to ask that question. I think if we polled You know, the studio audience today, there would be an overwhelming response. Well, yes, Pastor Tom, we believe in Jesus. The question we're asking is different. Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe that he was right about everything? Because sometimes you bet on your opinion being more right than his opinion. And we've all done this. I certainly don't ever want to come across in a condescending way, although I can... Uh, be at times a little bit flippant, sometimes uh, a bit in your face. I want you to know that I am with you. I deal with these same issues, struggle with many of these same deals that we talk about uh, week in and week out. And so I, I want you to know that there are times that I will even bet against Jesus. And that's rather Uh, ludicrous, actually. We are right now in the midst of March Madness. How many of you have filled out your brackets? Okay, all of you. How many of you uh, have been a little disappointed in the way things have turned out? Especially those of us who are morons, because we, I, will speak for myself, I actually picked a six seed. 
to win the national championship. And that would have been okay, except for my particular pick uh, lost the first day of the tournament. Now, there are a lot of games that are transpiring over the next few weeks, and there's no way I'm going to you know, win anybody's pool because I have uh, chosen poorly. Um, but the way a tournament is seeded is they, the, they being the experts, try to figure out ahead of time who should win this tournament. And then that individual or that group, that team, will get a higher seed than those who kind of have a chance but probably won't win. Those are seeded lower. Now, I picked a six to become the national champion. So I went out on a limb a little bit. You know, I'm living a little bit of a risky life, you know, with uh, my picks for the tournament. You know, sometimes I wonder if our conversations with God were ever... Um, diagram the way you might see the brackets for the NCAA tournament. In fact, if we had a conversation and we had to figure out who we're going to believe, whether it's going to be Jesus or you, it's real important to look at seeding because Jesus is like the number one seed, which means that the experts predict from the very beginning he should probably win every time. His opinions are dominant. His, you know, he's God. He, he like made the cosmos. He, he made all the rules. He created all the laws that govern the cosmic universe. He made all the rules that govern the social universe. Uh, he created us to have a relationship with him. He laid out in his word, you know, that system of principles that would best serve us in our lives. So he's the one seed. Now, what are, what are you? Uh, you would be like, I don't know, how many people have ever lived? 12 billion, 344 million, 220,101. I don't know if that's your seeding, but you're down in at least the 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 billion range. And so here's the question I'm going to ask. Who are you going to pick? Now, I just, I, I, I don't even know what the rest of the universe is like. I will tell you that on this planet, there is not a tree with branches long enough for you to go out on a limb and pick you over Jesus. And yet that's what we do. We truly believe somehow. I don't know where this comes from. We truly believe somehow Jesus is someone we can believe in, but we can't believe him. But he was right about everything. And so where's the disconnect? Um, not being an electrician, I have a problem every time a light switch doesn't turn on the fixture. So where's the disconnect? Uh, is it the fixture? Could be. Could be faulty fixture. You might want to package that bad boy up and send it back and get another one. But you might get another one and it still might not work because it's not the fixture. Could be the switch. So you get a new switch. Still didn't work. Okay, maybe it's a fuse. You say, you should have checked that first. That's free. You go outside, check the fuse box. Okay, the fuse is good. Well, what's the problem? It must be the wiring in the house. Are you getting this? There might be a lot of reasons why there's no power. But regardless of the reason, there's a disconnect. And it doesn't matter where the disconnect is. There's, there's really no power. The Apostle Paul... Um, made a couple of comments, and I know this is not, you know, Jesus speaking directly, but in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, he said this, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Three things. Now, the first of those, prayer, we call that acceptance. That's when we pray, and we're going to apply this, you know, to our finances, but you can apply it to anything. All, all three of these we're going to walk through. You can apply this to anything. But at some point, you accept that God is going to have a lot to say about what happens in your life. Are we okay with that one? I don't know where you're going to be like next week, next month, next year, 10 years from now. I just believe that wherever you find yourself, God was a major player in kind of orchestrating events to get you there. Okay, so we accept that. Now the problem is most of you, and I say most of you strictly because statistically it's true. I don't know you personally, and so I'm not trying to be you know, judgmental or too condemning. I'm just looking at statistics, and I think this is borne out by the data. But most people, when it comes to their finances, this is all they do. This is how we, sometimes only, the only way 
we express the fact that we believe in Jesus. We believe in Jesus because we, we think he's powerful and we know that our lives will evolve on a course that he's going to have direct input in. And so we pray to him and we say, Lord, we want to be, you know, at this particular place down the road, would you please allow that to happen? And we cry out to God. And it's a very unsettled economic environment that we find ourselves in these days. And so some of us pray more now than ever. And uh, we've lost a lot. We could at any point in time lose our job, our, our ability to generate income, lose our pension. Um, we, we, could, we could lose you know, financially in so many ways. And so our prayers are elevated and this is what we do and that's all we do. And, and when things get tough... We just pray more because that is the only strategy we have. That's our default. And there's nothing wrong with prayer. I would tell you, always pray. Pray without ceasing. I mean, just when it comes to money, when it comes to family, when it comes to your, your physical health, when it comes to your mission, it comes to your oikos, pray, 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 pray. But devote yourselves to prayer, comma. Sometimes it's not just, it's not prayer that you lack. And by the way, we don't even have to tell you to pray for finances. I mean, it would be silly for me to say, have you tried praying? <laughs> because you already have been going, oh, well, God, you know, I know this. So let's go to the next step, being watchful. There's an action item. There is a managerial component to a good strategy, and that was our, our theme last week. And then there's a, a third, and this is where we're going to land a little bit today. It's the attitude behind it. There has to be an attitude of gratitude, a thankful heart in order to see things happen, in order for there to be power. So I look at those three before we leave them. I just, I want to, you know, not that you'll be able to answer the question yet because we're still not done. But, you know, prayer, you just, are you not praying? Are you not managing? Or do you have a bad attitude? Because it takes all three to make a connection. Now, let's go to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For your, where your treasure is... There your heart will be also. Now watch this. I, I feel like Jesus is wanting to make a connection here. And I see him almost in a grandpa kind of mode right now as he's speaking. And this is the way I am now. This is a phase of my life where, you know, grandchildren are dominating, you know, most things, uh, in, including finances. And, <laughs> and when I want to make a point with my grandchildren, I have to get down and make sure that they're getting this. Because with kids, it's like deer in the headlights. It's like, I don't get it. <laughs> and so you, you say, now you understand that if you hit your sister, listen, if you hit your sister, you go to timeout. And you don't want to go to timeout. Do you? No, Pablo. Okay. If you hit your sister, you go to timeout. Now, if you don't hit your sister, you don't have to go to timeout. And you can play we. And that's what you want to do. Isn't that right? Uh-huh. Yes, Papa. So you're not going to hit your sister anymore, huh? No, Papa. And even after the conversation, it's like, did he get that? <laughs> I don't know if he got that. And when Jesus is speaking here, it's almost like he's talking to the guys and it's saying, now, guys, listen. You don't want to store up for yourselves treasures on earth, do you? I mean, because moth and rust will get in there and destroy them, and thieves can break in and steal, so that's not a good idea, is it? And I can just see the guys going, huh. <laughs> what you want to do is you want to store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, huh? Because in heaven, there's no moths, there's not rust, and there are no bad guys to break in and steal what you, what you got. That's what you want to do, huh? Yeah, huh? Because in communication, and this is, this is a basic principle of communication, if they don't get it, you haven't communicated. 
Now, you might stand back and say, well, I said my piece. I shared my heart. I told them exactly the way it was. Big whoop. If they don't get it, what was the point? And so we read passages like this. And it's, again, you know, I don't know, I don't know where the disconnect is. What's the problem? Is it a switch problem, a fixture problem, a wiring problem, a fuse problem? I don't know. Is it a prayer problem? Is that what you, you're not praying? Or, or is it a management issue? Or do you just have this attitude of entitlement and you're not thankful for what God has given you? But whatever the reason, do you get this? Because you should, and I should, we should get this. There is nothing more simple than this. Where's your heart? Where's your affection? Where is your love? Check your bank statement. You get a monthly printout. And that's maybe the simplest thing Jesus has ever said. But see, what you're thinking right now is, I don't know. Okay, look at the seating again. And who are you going to bet on? Jesus is appealing here to our sense of logic. I mean, look where you're investing. You're investing in a sinking ship. And you know what kind of sense that makes? None. I mean, what are you thinking? I mean, why would you want to invest in a stock that is guaranteed to lose value every day? Would you do that? And everybody in this room said, hey, no, heck no, I'm not going to do that. Hey. I'd never do that. Well, then why do we? That's exactly what we do when we invest in what we will most certainly lose. And here's, here's the lesson. Affection trumps logic. And even when you, you know, do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Do you believe Jesus? Yes. What's your bank statement say? Oh, well, that's... That's different. <laughs> you know why? Because your affection trumps your logic. Have you ever seen a kid in love? <sighs> Have you ever... Premarital's come in for counseling. i just so in love. Why do you love him? Because he makes me feel like I've never felt before. Well, that's not going to last. <laughs> so let's... Try to dig a little deeper here. <laughs> you know, it's got this glazed over look. You know what it is? They just, they, they're in, it's affection. Affection. We do things because of affection that make no sense at all. What's the, what's the phrase? Love is blind. And when we're in love, we just do dumb stuff. And when we're in love... With the world, we do dumb stuff. And you don't want to do dumb stuff, <laughs> do you? Yeah. <laughs> heart disease is the leading cause of death in the U.S. And heart disease is the leading cause of frustration in the body of Christ. Now, last weekend, we discussed different motives for obedience, and, and this time we're going to land on of the three that we shared, and we're building here. It's a series, so if you weren't here last weekend, you might want to check that out online, um, but we go into why you would obey the Bible in any, in any, any area of life. Why would you obey? To honor the Lord, to be blessed. And, and to be missional, to help people know God so that their lives can be transformed as our lives have been transformed. Now, the motive of being blessed, nothing wrong with the motive of being blessed and nothing wrong with the motive of being missional, but one of these motives in and of themselves is incomplete. 
there are three things to consider. Now, being blessed is, when it comes to money, I mean, God says, I want you to be blessed. Now, he knows that really gets us all geeked up and we want to be blessed. He knows that is a window to our soul. And so he says in his word, in fact, Malachi said, bring the whole tithe. Now, tithe is a financial term. It's, in fact, it's a mathematical term. Literally, he says, bring one-tenth of what I have given you to manage. Bring one-tenth into the storehouse, into the kingdom, giving back to God that there may be food in my house, that what happens in God's kingdom is fueled. And then he says, test me in this. Now, this is what I love because nowhere in the Bible does it say you can test God. In fact, you might want to avoid that, especially on a day where there are thunder showers. <laughs> you don't test God. But what God says when it comes to money, he says, I want you to be blessed financially. I want you to test me in this one. And just see, just see, just see if I would not bless you. Just see if I can outgive you. God's speaking. And he can. He's better at giving than you and I are. He will always be better at giving than you and I are. He will always outgive us. And he says, you don't believe that? Because that's weird. That just doesn't make any sense. And that's why he says, this is why I want you to put me to the test. Because I want to bless you. I want to bless you. And I will if you obey. This is cause and effect. You bring, I'll throw. You don't bring, I don't throw. It's called the law of the harvest. It's everywhere in the OT and the NT, Old Testament and New Testament. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor the Lord with your wealth, what you're managing, with the first fruits, we'll get to that later, of all your crops. And then, honor, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing, vats brim over, with new wine. In other words, you cannot outgive God. And that's, that's what he said. I know you believe in God, but do you believe God? But there's the motive to be blessed that people would be transformed. That's another good motive to be missional. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. You'll be made rich in every way so you can be generous on every occasion, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. That people would give thanksgiving to God. That people would be transformed. And when God lets us manage and we are generous, then our generosity is actually missional and people respond in a positive way to, to the gospel. And so you give to ministries that are working with the Japanese people that in the name of Jesus they would find relief from a very difficult situation. And what happens when we are generous, that results in others giving thanksgiving to God. You give to an impact offering so that young people can go to camp. And some of you, um, your kids aren't old enough to go to camp, but they will be. And, and later in life, you have no more kids at home that are going to camp. And so maybe this is a good opportunity to reach out to a family who's trying to send one or two or three, sometimes more children to a fairly expensive experience now. I remember when camp is, when I was a kid, camp was like 40 bucks for a week. Yeah, that's how old I am. And it's not that anymore. I mean, it's, it's many times more than that. But when kids go, lives are transformed and they give thanksgiving to God because of your generosity. That's just being missional with your money. And we've always said, you know, 86% of our church family is, is not being obedient to what the Bible says about the tithe. It's just, it, it's a statistic. It's not that we're angry. It's not that we're going to, you know, if you don't give, God's calling me home. It's none of that. It's, you know, I'm not, you know, moving to the beach. I'm, I'm stuck there with you, and I'm loving that. <laughs> just telling you, it is what it is. So what are we going to do? If more people were obedient... There would be more ministry. There would be more transformed lives. There would be an enhanced mission. And we would be more blessed. And God would be more greatly praised and honored. I don't see the downside. Is there a downside to this? 
And, and then there's a great passage that has them all, all, all of them, Philippians 4. Paul says, I'm not looking for a gift. I believe Paul, by the way. I think when he wrote the Bible, he's telling the truth. He says, I'm not looking for any personal advantage. And I want you to know, whenever we provide these presentations on giving, it's not so I can get a raise. I don't care what you do in response to this. I ain't getting a raise. That's just not going to happen, and that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for what may, may be credited to your account, that you would be blessed, that you would have the privilege of seeing lives transformed, that you would have the joy of honoring God. This is not about HDC. This is about you. I've received full payment, and even more, I'm amply supplied. I can say that categorically here. And uh, we are always blessed. We're just thankful for you. Our mission is on track. It could be greatly enlarged, but right now it's on track. I mean, we're doing what we're doing. Now I've, got, I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, fragrant offering, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. There's worship. And my God will meet your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. There's the blessing. It's... Where's the disconnect? I gotta, I gotta say it another way. I gotta. It, it, we have to communicate here. You have to understand this. You can't walk away from this presentation. Oh, you can, and many of you perhaps will. Like the Pharisees, who we found out last week, were sneering at Jesus. They were betting on themselves. They didn't recognize his seating. You know, this EKG, this EKG is, is going to measure our gratitude. He's hooking us up. Jesus is hooking us up. And, and now, you know, those little, those little uh, connecting points and, and the wires all going to that little graph is measuring how thankful we are for what we have. So here we go. A couple of things about gratitude. Very simple idea today, by the way. Um, and somehow they, simple doesn't matter sometimes, I guess. But here we go. Consider every expenditure a thank you note. Every time you make an expenditure, write a check, use your debit card, use a credit card. Dave Ramsey won't like that, but some people still think that miles is key. And if that's what you want, then that's what you do. Here, here's the point. Whatever expenditure it is and however it's made... It's a thank you note. You're always thankful. And the best, what did Jesus say? Want to check how thankful you are? Go to your bank statement. So look at your bank statement. All of those expenditures are thank you notes to somebody. Um, this, this, whenever we pay taxes, what's your attitude? It is probably bad because most Christians aren't Christ-like. And I'm not, I'm not even saying that they spend our taxes like we want them to, and I'm, I'm not, you know, there's probably all kinds of different opinions about how to spend taxes, tax money, and how much tax money to collect. And you've got wonderful Christian people, you know, kind of arguing every possible side, which means that everybody has an opinion, but nobody's really right. But that's not my point. We can discuss that. You can discuss that some other time. What I want to talk about is what your attitude is when you pay your taxes. And let me tell you why, when you pay Uncle Sam, you should be thankful. Because you live in a great country. That's why. And you don't have to pay taxes. There's an alternative. And I'm not talking about going to jail. <laughs> because, that, because that also is an alternative. <laughs> but there, there, before jail, you can avoid paying taxes. And you, know, you want to know how? Move to another country. Because when you pay taxes, you're saying, thank you that I get to live here. You know, I'm so glad this past week I didn't get a knock at the door from somebody at the State Department said, we had a downsize and we just need somebody to go talk to Gaddafi. <laughs> and Pastor Tom, we think you're the man. <laughs> I said, I don't think I could, I can't go to Gaddafi by myself. Well, do you have any friends that will go with you? <laughs> you know, I'm so thankful I don't have to climb inside an F-16 and take off of the flat top of an aircraft carrier to go engage an enemy. 
Now, that might be exhilarating, and I know some of you that have flown those missions are proud of your service as we are for you. And at the same time, it might have been, you know, t- just your taking pride in doing a great job. And I get all that, but I'm just thankful it's you doing that. And I can be on this stage today instead of roaming the skies above Libya. And yet, as I stand here, there are hundreds of thousands of men and women around the globe right now defending, laying their life on the line to defend my right and ability to stand up here and talk to you this morning. And I'm thankful for that. And, and you know, every time I... Every time you throw out the patriotic deal and you say we're thankful for our troops and we are and we love America and I am and everybody wants to cheer, Um, so my next statement is on April 15th we get to pay for it. Anybody want to clap now? (laughs) And I'm thankful. And, and I, I just, I have to be, because I get to be a part of the greatest country in modern history. And why, do, why don't other people who I see on TV, why aren't they here living the kind of lives that we live? And the answer, my answer, I don't know, but I'm sure thankful. And then why do you give money uh, to... The gas company. How about a utility company? How, how much was your gas bill? Oh, I looked at mine this last week. Wow. You know what I am? I, I'm thankful for my gas. And it's not because I like gas. It's because I like to eat. And I like to be warm at night. And I'm thankful for that. And I I can cook. Well, Cheryl can cook. But I can eat what Cheryl cooks. I'm thankful for that too. Why do I direct money to the grocery store? Because I'm thankful I didn't have to grind my own grain. I didn't have to kill my own chickens. I didn't have to raise my own eggs. I can just drive down and drive my cart, (laughs) drive my cart (laughs) down an aisle, and I can just throw stuff in the basket. We go, we, you, you shop at Costco now, you, don't even have, you never have to cook. You just have to have the gas that the gas company sent you, and you're good to go. And it's not just Costco. Costco, we don't even call it Costco. It's a 500 club in our family. Because <laughs> you can't get out of there for less than $500, it seems. Just thankful. Why do you send money to General Motors or Ford? Because, you know, their technology makes your lifestyle much more convenient. And maybe, and Dave Ramsey's right. You know, you probably should have paid for that ahead of time. But since now you've chosen to pay monthly payments every time you write a check, are you thankful you don't have to take public transportation? Should be. And some of you do take public transportation. There's no shame in that. But when you pay that fare that goes up, it seems, every year, are you thankful you don't have to walk because you could and and if some of you have to walk because you can't afford the fare for public transportation are you thankful that you've got two legs to walk on see this attitude is key we have this entitlement that we deserve something for some reason we think we deserve something and I'm sorry, I'm going to climb back on another soapbox here. Tell me, what, what do we deserve? To go to hell. Just remember that. Assume in every conversation that you need more grace than the person you're talking to. And your relationships will be cleaned up immediately. Just recognize what you deserve in your life and what you don't deserve in your life. And if you get what you deserve, you go straight to hell. You, do not, you don't even get your 200 bucks. Pass, you don't pass go. You just go. That's what we deserve. See, the next time the server doesn't deliver the food quite when you think they should, remember what you deserve. And that'll change your attitude toward the server. 
Because cold food, <laughs> you wouldn't even get that in hell. Everything's hot in hell. <laughs> Thankful I haven't been there to and tell you firsthand. Why do you direct money to a movie theater? Because you're thankful for their seats, especially during the movie. Those seats are a lot cheaper when they're not showing a movie. But for those two hours, it's going to cost you a few bucks. And you could say, yeah, ridiculous prices. Well, what's the alternative? Go home and watch TV. Do you understand <laughs> yet? That's it. I mean, this is such a simple idea. Why do you direct money to the church? Because you're thankful to God for what he's accomplished in your life and in your family through the amazing institution, the absolutely amazing institution of his church, the place you always go when there's a crisis, the place you send your children to learn about God's love, the place you entrust your students to, so that they can get a balanced view of their reality because the world doesn't offer them any clarity. The place you come every week to be encouraged in your walk with Christ. That's why you write a thank you note to the church, to the Lord, because it's his church. Now, here's the first point there, and I'll be quick. I know I'm running out of time here. Number one is write the most important thank you note first. Okay, now this is key. <laughs> because your gratitude to God is framed by everyone or everything under God on your list. And I'll show you what I mean. Everybody has a list. It's in your outline. Um, you may not actually have written this list out, but in your mind, you know you have a list. What am I most thankful for? You figure out who or what you're most thankful to or what you're thankful for the most, and you write that thank you note first. For example, when it comes to Uncle Sam, I've already stated, very thankful to be an American. And, and that is a first fruits thank you note in this culture because they actually <laughs> write this thank you note for you. Your employer writes this thank you note for you before you see your paycheck. Which means that if you are going to, in your mind, think, I am more thankful to Uncle Sam than I am to God. I like what Uncle Sam is doing for me more than I like what God is doing for me. And if that's your attitude, then your employer really has done you a favor. If that is not your attitude, then you have to do some refiguring later on. You know what first fruits is? First fruits. And right now, if you crafted a gift to God on the second line, it would be second fruits. And in the first century, and you, you hear the phrase, first fruits, first fruits, you know what's that mean? In the first century, in, in the ancient world, even B.C., the thought of being thankful to anybody more than you're thankful to God was laughable. See, when they talked about first fruits in that culture, it was like, well, duh, and in ours, this, are you serious right now? And if you are more thankful to Uncle Sam than you are to God, then write that one first. If you're more thankful for what the bank or credit union does for you than you are for what God does for you, then write your thank you note to the Lord on the basis of what's left after you've thanked Uncle Sam and you've thanked the bank. And if you're more thankful for what the grocer does for you than what God does for you, then write your thank you note to the Lord on the basis of what's left after you have thanked Uncle Sam and the bank and the grocer. And if you're more thankful for what the utility companies do for you than for what God does for you, then write your thank you note to the Lord on the basis of what's left over after you've thanked Uncle Sam, the bank, the grocer, and the utility companies. And then after you've listed all the recreational interests that you have, all the things you need to do in your life, then write your thank you note to the Lord on the basis of what's left after you thanked Uncle Sam, the bank, the grocery, the utility companies, and the recreation. And then you get to the bottom and you say, okay, now I'm going to thank the Lord. I mean, I have to thank the Lord, but watch this. Your gift to the Lord is reflected, framed, by everything that is either under your gift to the church or to a particular ministry. And so now, at the end of that list, and this is the question, what's left over? And you say, not much. 
And what's your gift to the Lord? Not much. You see why first fruits is a real important concept? It's the only way anybody ever gets in the game. When it comes to honoring God with our wealth, being blessed by God, (laughs) moving the ball down the field in regard to our mission. Do you get this? This is why our culture is so self-absorbed. Why Satan has so bedeviled us into providing for ourselves unilaterally. And you don't give to the church or you don't not give to the church because you are upset at the church or because you're mad at Tom or because you think there's something systemically wrong with the ministry at HDC. You don't not send money to relief agencies around the world because you don't like people. You don't not provide a gift for a camp, an impact offering for a kid to go to camp because you can't stand children. You give or don't give. Excuse me, you don't give simply because at the end of the the bill cycle... Pastor Tom, there's nothing left. Which is why, from the very beginning, God said, this is very simple. Change the order of the bill cycle. And whatever fruits you think are appropriate, make sure you thank the most important person in your life first. So you write that most important note first. Once again, Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. First fruits of all your crops. And these are powerful words. Wealth, your wealth, first fruits. Watch this one. All your crops. But you know what most powerful word in that whole sequence is? This one right here. Then. We got something going on. Write it first. Secondly, plan that thank you note carefully. Careful giving is not emotional. It's not spontaneous. It's careful. It's strategic. It's not something that you respond to a need. I mean, I am all about relief gifts to relief agencies. And we should all be involved whenever we're able, as the Lord leads, tears in our eyes, reaching out in that that simple human spirit of, of wanting to encourage those who are down, very godly. That can be emotional. That can be spontaneous. Even an impact offering for kids going to camp. You know, oh, yeah. Oh, man, we can get into that. I can, I'm feeling that. I hear those testimonies, and I'm just crying listening to those testimonies. But when it comes to our regular strategic support, For God's work, you need two things. You don't need to emote. You need two things. You need a pay stub and a calculator. That's what you need. And some of you guys are so good at math, you you don't even need a calculator. All you got to do is move the decimal point over after you look at your pay stub. And there you go. And it's got to be careful. Look what Paul, he's writing the, the, the Corinthian church again, and he said, let each man decide or... Each man should give. Each person should give what he has decided in his heart to give. So a lot of people say, well, oh, I'm just going to give then what I decide to give. No, what you've decided in your what? In your heart. How thankful. When you've decided how thankful you are, that frames your gift. You know, some people read that and, and they don't think, okay, that kind of, that, that doesn't show us a percentage. It doesn't show us, you know, that there's any, you know, uh, mathematical guidelines. No, the Bible already has established those guidelines. We're to begin this discipline of being generous. But after we understand the guidelines, make sure that we carefully consider how it affects our attitude. Because just management doesn't turn on the power. Just prayer and management doesn't turn on the power, but it's prayer and management and gratitude. Number three, write that thank you note consistently. In verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 16, now about the collection of God's people, for God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do, and so right away you know this is not just for the Corinthians, but it's a general principle for the church. 
on the first day of every week, that would be Sunday, each one set aside a sum of money in keeping with what? Income, pay stub. Just get the pay stub, okay? See, that's why <laughs> just, just get the pay. Go home, look at the bank statement, check out where your heart is because Jesus said where your treasure is, that's where your heart is, that's what you're grateful for, that's what you're enamored with, that's what you're in love with. And, and th- this could not be a more simple strategy. And you, you make it consistently. See, that's regularly, carefully, consistently, strategically. And then write that thank you note confidently. Why do we write it confidently? Not because of what is said, but who said it. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus said, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, you know, how, who said that? Jesus said that. We know Jesus said that for a couple of reasons. Number one reason is this, right here. It's in Luke, so there's a pretty good chance Jesus said it. Uh, the second thing is, um, that tells us Jesus said it, is, is because it really isn't very logical. You know, at times, especially from our paradigm, wait a minute, I need, so I'm supposed to now give? And Jesus said, all right, you don't agree with me. Uh, So what are you going to do? What's your pick? What's your pick? And if you don't agree with that statement, and that's why I'm confident to tell you what I'm telling you because I didn't make this up. And if you don't agree with that statement, then uh, and that's fine because it's a free country. You you don't have to agree with anything we say. But now you tell me you don't agree. Now we got that problem again because I really, I really love you. But I believe Jesus was right about everything. Father, we pray for our hardened little hearts that you would soften them up, for our confused minds that, Father, you would give us clarity, help us to see very clearly your love, your compassion, your concern, to believe that the Scriptures are true, that the plans you have for us are to prosper us, not to just loot our bank accounts. Not to manipulate, but to bless. And I would just hope that at some point, everybody listening to this challenge in whatever auditorium they're sitting in, or wherever they might be around the world watching this online, I pray that a light would finally go on. With everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed, you know, whatever you do with this, you do with this. It's not my problem, I'm the messenger. And I deliver what I believe Jesus said. I deliver that faithfully to you every weekend. And I just ask if, you know, you believe him, what are you going to do? I mean, really, you guys, what are you going to do now? Are, Are you going to just keep doing the same old, same old? Or are you going to believe Jesus was right? And if you don't know Jesus, you know this is... uh, uh, this whole challenge is for those who are part of his, his family. Uh, but maybe it's not that you need to believe him as much as you need to believe in him. See, if you're not a Christian, you need to believe in him. And uh, at HTC, you talk about ABC, admit that you need help with your life and believe that Jesus can help you and save you from the problems that you have created for yourself. And the fact that your sin is projecting your eternal destiny being separated from God forever. And if you'll believe that Jesus can save you from that, if you'll choose, admit, believe, and then choose to place your faith in Christ, he'll change your forever, he'll change your tomorrow. Uh, he's, He's a game changer. And Lord, as you change hearts today, we give you all the credit, all the glory. Look forward to being together again next week. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Amen. Welcome, Forms in the Basket, and new series next weekend. We'll see you then.